Uh, you got to like the title of this next one, View from a Tractor Seat. Dave is a farm kid from Northfield who chose public education as a career. His education includes a BS in education from Minnesota State Mankato, a master's in school administration and policy, and much advanced grad work in the environmental education. He spent 35 years teaching middle school environmental learning sciences, followed by five years of education director at Eagle Bluff and um, the Learning Center in Lanesboro. He, and he's worked uh, seven years for Don, John Deere Company as a tractor uh, tech and sales support person. Most recently, he served as executive director of the Cannon River Watershed Partnership in Northfield. And presently, he's continuing to farm eight, 850 acres of corn, soybean, and hay and beef. He actively engages in work with citizens groups and farmers to promote understanding of how our agriculture can have positive effects on water quality, soil, air, and farmer's profitability. David. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. The view from the tractor seat immediately took me to what our tractor seat's all about. So if we take a look at a John Deere 1935 Model G tractor, most farmers then were about five feet six and weighed about 150 pounds. And this was a tractor that seemed to meet their needs. Now you'll notice that this has the spacious operator's platform. <laughs> the reason it needed that was because you got so tired of riding that seat that you needed to stand up for a while. You'd see a lot of guys out there riding their John Deere standing up. I was one of them. Next, we move to a state-of-the-art seat. And one of my jobs when I worked for John Deere was to take my laptop, plug it into the computer of the tractor, and program the seat for the weight, the height, the amount of rebound that the operator desired. This should serve as a parallel uh, thinking path for how technology impacts agriculture today. As we look at technology in agriculture, this was kind of the, uh, the run-of-the-mill view from the tractor seat. Oh, those nice straight moldboard plow rows turning the soil over. However, technology has changed and has brought us someplace. That technology was back in the 1930s and the 20s with the F-14 tractor. Moldboard plowing has a definite effect and it has to do with soil tilth and carbon emissions. With a moldboard plow pass, within the first 24 hours, it emits 2,290 pounds of CO2. That's a tremendous amount of CO2. It also indicates that we are metabolizing carbon in the soil. So moldboard plowing, very, very damaging to our soils. A deep ripper, much less. And if we go down over here to a disc harrow or no-till, 51 pounds. And so we find that the technologies of the past have atmospheric implications as well as implications for the organic matter of our soil, which is a huge water retention device. When the raindrop falls on that soil with high organic matter, it sticks. We worry a lot about fuel and how much uh, carbon dioxide our tractors are belching. That's minuscule compared to plowing an acre of soil. Uh, each gallon of diesel fuel is only 22.4 pounds. So with, uh, with the view from the tractor seat, this is something we don't want to see with intensive tillage and after a rainfall, intensive erosion. So now new technology is coming out with strip till and no till. We hear a lot about uh, reduced tillage. This happens to be my machine that I use. It's called the Soil Warrior. And yes, the tractor has auto steer. So my tractor receives guidance from God. <laughs> <laughs> the Soil Warrior inserts the fertilizer in the growing zone. This is the path where the work was done. It's about six inches wide, eight inches deep, and these little white particles that you see are nitrate fertilizer. It's right in the row where the corn is going to grow. I don't fertilize the entire field anymore. It's just done in the strip. 
Will it handle high residue? My gosh, will it ever. This is about as thick as the hair on a dog's back and it will go through high residue and that gives us the opportunity to grow corn on corn on corn on corn without having to use the technology of the 30s, the moldboard plow, because common knowledge says the moldboard plow is the most dependable way to grow good corn on corn. I'm beginning to take serious issue with that, as you see in this photo. Erosion and tile. I view tiling as a conservation strategy. I took over some land from St. Olaf College a few years ago, and this is after the first year of planting no-till soybeans. And you can see that there really is a massive gully that had washed in my no-till field. Boy, that sure changed the paradigm. The reason is that this field has very strange hydrology with seeps up in the tops of hills, and we needed to manage the groundwater so that I could convert the entire field to no-till. Tiling was the way. And this is the day that the tile runs went in. These dark stripes up here are tile lines that were placed every 50 feet. The tile outlets now serve as a monitoring station for me. I've had several agencies that have come to snoop at my tile water and tell me what's going on there. And we have uh, technicians who come and take water samples. For me, it's really important what happens to the tile water. It goes across the road and goes into an infiltration basin that's full of cottonwoods and cattails and emerging aquatic vegetation, but the water stays on that land. It doesn't head for the nearest creek or the nearest river. It's there. Another technique is uh, drainage management. And I kind of like this idea. I haven't gotten it on my farm yet, but I'm working on it. These boxes that were alluded to earlier talk about being able to control the water in the soil. And so you pop off this cover, reach in with a hook, and pull out these logs or dams until the water can flow right straight through if we have heavy rain. It's really neat to be able to control the water in the soil, but overall we are reducing the amount of water in the, in the uh, tile system. When you insert tile, that's where the water table is. It would be nice with controlled drainage to be able to regulate that water. So in the early spring, we pull out the little dams, the water level goes down to the level of the tile, I can come in and plant, then we put the dams back in, the water level rises, and the crop utilizes the water. Then in the fall, when I want to drive my combine, I reduce the level of the water, and then in the winter, I put them back in. Reduces the total outflow of water significantly, and it also allows me to tinker with the water level in the soil so that I can water my corn plants almost like I would spoon feed them. This is uh, basically a field. You have to kind of do this from the beginning and put those structures right in uh, so that they work with the tile system. Uh, tile water holding structures have become rather innovative. This is a surge basin. This is a farmable basin where the tile water comes in at one level. There's tile outlets that are below uh, about two feet of soil and the water goes out. But in a dry period, you can drive through it and farm it. And in theory, you don't lose that land to production. But this is another technique to hold the water on the soil. This is a more overt view of a retention basin, very sizable. Another really cool thing that's happening that farmers are doing is they're using wood chip bioreactors to remove nitrate from tile water. Basically, the water is forced to flow through a trench full of wood chips. And the wood chips, through uh, their bioreaction, uh, take out the nitrate and it gasses off. It's a fairly simple, low-tech um, technique. And in this day and age, wood chips used to be kind of cheap when we had lots of elm disease, but uh, it still is a good technique to use. This shows a uh, Bioreactor being put in, it's just a trench lined with plastic. The water goes in one end, 
goes out the other with significantly reduced nitrate. Farmers do a lot of good things, and this to me was a public relations nightmare when somebody decided to plow the ditch. And in the spring, when everything melted, um, you can see what happened. But, by golly, it's my property, I'm going to farm it. So, got six more rows of corn around the telephone pole. It's very fortunate that he had a three row corn head to sneak by. And it wasn't too long before the county was there speaking to him about, you know, this is your property, but we have property responsibilities too. Another issue is why do farmers keep doing the same thing? Well, basically it's all of these. There's skepticism, fear of the coffee shop rub down, you know, leg volt, what the heck are you doing out there? And we get lots of mixed messages. But the main thing is people tend to follow the money. I had kids to send to college, I had grandchildren to help out, all of those things. So let's take a look at my subsidy. This is for the years 95 to 2006. My corn subsidy, that's a good chunk of change. Soybean subsidies, a good chunk of change. And that's colored somewhat by the counter cyclical programs that were enforced during those years when commodity prices were low and there were counter cyclical payments that entered in. Today, I wouldn't get that. Cool thing, wheat subsidy. I don't grow wheat. Really neat thing is I got $199 for growing oats. I don't grow oats. So you just get the subsidy. The disturbing thing to me was conservation for zero dollars. In the old system, the reason I got zero dollars for conservation, even though my family had been tapped as outstanding conservation cooperator family of the year in Dakota County in 01, is I had been doing it too long and I didn't qualify. So zero for conservation was a little upsetting. Fortunately, we are making progress so that now we are incentivizing farmers for good conservation practices. But still, there are mixed messages that uh, there's quite a few hoops to go through to get some of these programs. We really do need a change in our federal farm bill program. We need to link program payments uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we need to link conservation payments to practices. Program payments, I basically get my program payments because I have nice hair and I'm good looking. <laughs> and I sign the AD 1026, which says I will not bust new sod, I will not drain wetlands, I will not farm in a way that erodes the soil. I have to do that every single year. So if we look at our waterways, what we can do to enhance the uh, public relations and to take care of uh, our waters, buffers are a great way to stop sediment loss. Bigger buffers are better, 50 feet. It's 87% of the total sediment loss with a 50 foot buffer. Phosphorus and nitrate, significant reduction. And that looks much better, and it is the county and the state standard. The quarrel I have about this is that farmers do not have an adequate partnership when it comes to buffer work. This, I don't believe, we can't say that a cooperative or a contractor did this because they know better. But here we have somebody plowing and farming right up close to the creek, and you can see evidence of herbicide application practically, if not virtually right into the water. This was a couple of years ago. This was last year. <coughs> Same place this spring after the soybean stubble had been ripped and the runoff came. I think farmers can do better. And I know that 90% are doing a good job, but we are judged by the behavior of perhaps this 10%. So county planning and zoning bears responsibility for shoreland water filters. And this is an opportunity for them to step up beside farmers as partners with information, 
with education, with collaboration, with technical assistance, and the very last option is enforcement. We don't want to go there. So let's take a, a case study of a farmer who got busted. This is an actual case. This person received a letter from the county and they said, you are not in compliance with Minnesota sh uh, shoreline standards. Who might that person be? It was me. And boy, did my wife have a heyday when she opened the letter and said, you, Mr. Goody Two Shoes Conservation out there talking to people all the time, and we got busted for a buffer violation? Well, here's the story. This little sliver of land lies on the other side of the blue line, which is a creek. This is my side. I had forgotten that the boundary of our property was over here, and my neighbor has been farming up to the creek. Who owns it? Me. Who is responsible? Me. And my neighbor and I had a come to Jesus discussion about what needs to happen here, folks. And so I would not have known about this if Dakota County had not been proactive and had brought things uh, to a head. Another lost opportunity we have is with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture in our private pesticide certification program. I am one of those. I need to study the curriculum materials. I need to take the 50 point test. And it was very disturbing to me to find that there was only one question on protecting our waters. And that was number 33, what percent of Minnesotans use groundwater in the rural areas for their drinking water? 97%. Nothing about setbacks, buffers, how close you can spray certain chemicals, how far atrazine needs to be away from a vertical tile inlet. Those are all very critical concerns. So commodity organizations. Um, I have had a great deal of mixed information that has come down the pipe. And that concerns me also. I think it's impairing farmers from getting the right information. The print is a little small, so I'll help you out. Uh, one of the commodity organizations, Soybean, here in Minnesota, stated, scientific work to done to date has been termed as without merit and based on crude models. I tend to say, who makes the judgments that it's crude models? Uh, another initiative with Monsanto, Nature Conservancy, Delta Wildlife, Audubon Society, Iowa Soybean, to help reduce nutrient and sediment in the Mississippi, was nearly lost. Five million dollars worth from Monsanto was nearly lost when Minnesota Soybean objected. And they published a paper called Water Quality Issues in Production Agriculture, the Impact of Accepting Blame. Most farmers I know do not worry too much about blame. If there's a problem, they fix it. The last thing is from the 2011 Minnesota Soybean Resolutions, which state, we will work to protect farmers from the onslaughts of TMDL implementation. That's strident rhetoric, and I don't think it advances the farmer's cause at all. The ISA on farm network seems to be a model we ought to take a look at. I just read the Minnesota Farmer magazine and one of the articles was on farm network delivers. It talks about that group coming to Minnesota and doing some work. They have a good model. We have investments in proactive agriculture. We look at the Iowa soybean environmental services, sizable amount of money not much from checkoff, a great deal from partnerships. The on-farm network, sizable expenditures, not much from checkoff. Minnesota Soybean does great research, varietal and disease work, but no mention of environmental programs that are clearly stated. I have some friends near uh, Northfield. The really good looking guy right here is in the room with us today. I'll let you find him. But these three brothers who farm near Northfield are the epitome of a large progressive family farm. 
And their statement is, we didn't wait to start reducing erosion and improve our practices. It all goes together. It works together as a system. Another thing, we have a, a group in Minnesota, the Minnesota Crop Production Retailers, fertilizer and chemical salespeople, and in talking with the former president, who happens to be my agronomy guy, uh, we've talked a lot about what is in their heart. And I think they are working hard to work with farmers to improve the bottom line, but most importantly, they help farmers through education to make positive environmental choices so that they retain their right to make individual decisions. And I think that may be an organization we need to pay attention to to develop some partnerships to assist farmers. So if my assistant Adam back there can hit the right button, we'll see what this next guy has to say. associated with water quality uh, want to know. Talking with other farmers about conservation is important to Dave. He also works with student scientists at St. Olaf College in Northfield studying runoff from farm fields. A lot of people talk about the environment, a lot of people talk about farmers in the environment, but you are looking into it, you're trying to find out stuff firsthand yourself, right? Yes, and um, I've come to realize that if we do things that enhance water and soil quality, it's more profitable and it's better for the environment. Dave says confronting environmental challenges like soil erosion and chemical runoff is critical to the long-term success of American agriculture. I don't think we need to fear that our world will grow hungry as long as we have the American farmer on board but that also carries with it the awesome responsibility of increasing production to tremendous levels and doing so in a sustainable way. That'll do it for this time. Thanks for a trip. The reason you saw that is because I could never say the same thing twice and I thought this was a good way to sum it up. <laughs> That's the view from the tractor seat.